Well, I am Judy Ann Gallego Leonard, and I am doing a workshop called This Isn't What I Signed Up For, Encouragement for Spouses Living in a Fishbowl. And I'm just delighted that each one of you have decided to come. So let me ask you, right off the bat, how many of you are married to a pastor or a previous pastor? Okay, all of, all of the women. Okay, great. Um, if, if you are seeing some men here, they are pastors. And so they're kind of also know what it's like. <laughs> um, I just came from being a spy. I have to start this with a confession. I went into a workshop that uh, Sarah Tricky and Joyce Schwank were putting on uh, for a time for pastor's wives. How many of you were at that one? I know Sandy was. Oh, most everybody. OK. What a, what a great workshop that was. That was so encouraging. At the very beginning, she said, we have that in common. You know, We're all pastor's wives. And if you're not a pastor's wife, you need to leave. Well, I'm not a pastor's wife. <laughs> <laughs> but I chose to stay anyway and to spy on you guys. <laughs> um, but actually, um, I do know a lot about what it is to be married to someone who's in ministry, not so much from firsthand experience. My late husband was a part-time pastor, and we worked in youth work uh, for several years. But I know more from my own experience of working with pastors' wives and with women in ministry. Um, I'm a therapist out at Shepherd's Canyon, uh, where we put on intensive workshops for pastors and their wives that are being challenged or going through a crisis. And so I talk to a lot of women out there and do marriage counseling with pastors' wives. Um, I also work with a couple other ministries where I work with missionaries and um, global workers who are struggling. Um, so I've heard these stories over and over again, and there's a, there's a theme to them. So I feel like I have a pretty good handle on it, even though I can't say I'm a pastor's wife. I'm just a spy. <laughs> um, as, as all of you know, you have things in common, and you have things that you don't exactly have in common. I know from talking to some of you that you come from all different places. Um, some of you knew before you got married what you were getting into. How many, how many knew you were marrying a pastor? Let me just ask you that. Okay, it's about half. Some of you knew you were marrying a pastor. Some of you had no idea. It was kind of a bait and switch thing. You know, you thought you're marrying a teacher and you end up with a, you know, being him being a pastor. And what does that make you? You know, pastor's wife. Um, some of you uh, have been doing it for years. Some of you um, are newbies. Some of you haven't been doing it a long time. Uh, some of you are married to a lead pastor. Some of you are married to an associate. Some of you might even be in a place where you're still trying to figure out what you're doing. Maybe you've retired, or maybe your, your husband's getting ready to retire. Some of you might have grown up in Christian homes, and some of you are still learning what it means to create a Christian home. So what I'm saying is that you all have in common that you are pastor's wives, but there's also some differences between you. Um, there was a survey that was done a couple of years ago, uh, an informal survey of about 3,000 pastor's wives. And they put them in four distinct categories that I thought was pretty interesting. The first one was, and I was talking to Sandy just a few minutes ago, she was telling me about her experience and that she didn't feel like you needed too much encouragement because it's been pretty good. It's been a blessing. Yeah, well, you would fit into that first group, Sandy, then. The group that says, many are genuinely excited and consider ministry to be a great privilege. There's been ups and downs, but you love your life and you choose it again. That's you, OK. Um, and there's, there, that's probably a, a large amount of people. The second group that they came up with was that you're not quite as excited. Um, you found your life to be pretty stressful, more challenging than the way you thought it was going to be when you got into ministry. And the jury's kind of out. It could go either way. If your husband decides, I think I'm going to get out of the ministry and find another career, you know you'll survive. And you might even feel a little bit relieved by that. So that's the second one. The third one is a smaller group. And these are women who have been broken. Their dreams have been shattered. Um, they've just kind of had it with the criticism in the church, the change moving from here to there, the financial struggles. And they kind of feel like they're done. 
and they feel like their family has taken one for the team too many times and they fight against bitterness and they, they look ahead to serving more years. There's just kind of a sinking feeling like, you know, I really don't want to do this anymore. And then the fourth group are the ones that are smaller, but that they're deeply frustrated by the church. They're angry with the way the church is handling a lot of the social issues. They're disillusioned with people. They're disillusioned um, emotionally, physically. They're distancing. And, and some of them are even struggling to know how, how their faith in God is. You know, is he really there? All that we've been through, how can I really keep my confidence and my, my trust in him? And I, as I was sharing with some people before they came, before the rest of you came in, I work at Shepherd's Canyon, and that's a retreat center that's in Wickenburg, not too far from here, where um, people who are in ministry have been hurt. Um, they've been hurt by the church, um, by people who have either rejected or said or done things that are hurtful. Um, they're hurting in their marriages. They're hurting individually. There's just all kinds of struggles that they can't quite figure out how to, um, how to resolve. And so they're looking for a safe place where they can talk about that and find healing. And so I will unashamedly give a commercial. <laughs> to tell you that this is an amazing ministry that I've been a part of um, for um, six, seven years now. And I've seen so many people come in one way, like a before picture, and leave another way, like an after picture. And so I will promote that. And I just happen to have a flyer here for you that I will pass out in a little bit so you can take a look at it. I was thinking about expectations. They're kind of like masks. And I'm in Arizona, so I don't have to wear a mask all the time. I live in California. It depends on what county I'm in. But if I, if I was like this and you just met me, you know, you would look and you'd probably do what I do when people have masks. It's like, what do you look like? <laughs> you know, what do you really look like? I, I can see your eyes. I can see your hair. But I don't really know what you look like. And I think... That's kind of the way it is when you go into ministry. We have some sort of expectations on the way we think it's going to be. We think that very first call is going to be. But in actuality, when, when you get there, it's never the way that you think it's going to be. What I'd like you to do now is um, to just get into some little, little groups here. We're going to talk about this a little bit. So I'm going to ask you two ladies to get together here, if we could. Yeah, you two. Could I have you scoot over and talk to the gal over there in the back? OK. And then I'll have you two and you two, because I know the rest of you, you can get together and talk, but I, <laughs> but I know that you're uh, you're not in the same place as some of them, OK? What I want you to do um, is I would like for you, I would like for you to discuss just briefly when you went to your, before you went to your very first call, what did you expect that it was going to be like? Well, first share your name, how long you've been in ministry. But then say, before you ever went. You know, what did you think it was going to be like? You guys could talk about that back there, too, for that matter. What did you expect? Okay? Can you just do that for a couple of minutes? <laughs> Two, three. Okay. Okay, I'm going to ask you to come back. So did anybody find that your, um, 
that, that your first call was exactly like you thought it was going to be. Nah. Similar? Yeah, I'd say so, yeah. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Not a shock. Okay, well, good, good. I'm glad to hear that. But for the rest of you, it sounds like maybe there were some things that were very different than you thought that it was going to be. Or just even being in ministry is different than you thought that it was going to be. This is a story that's from one of my friends that I asked her to write it out. I thought it was so cute about when she first went into um, a, living in a parsonage. Have any of you ever lived in a parsonage? Okay, a few of you have. That's a whole different experience, isn't it, than when you don't have your own space. So she talks about her life living in a parsonage. She said, I was young. I was actually too young to be a pastor's wife. But when you're young and excited to serve the Lord, moving to what seemed like the last frontier in North America, it was St. John, British Columbia, 50 miles north on the Alaskan Highway, everything was an adventure. However, I needed to hone a few skills on the home front. Our home was connected to the church. The living room was separated from the sanctuary by a broken accordion door. You know this isn't going to end well. <laughs> accordion wall. <laughs> All the rooms except our bedroom were used on Sundays, including the basement for Sunday school classes. I worked full time, so that left Saturday for shopping, cleaning, and laundry, and to have everything absolutely perfect for Sunday. I really wanted everyone's approval. The church had a washing machine in the basement with rope and clothespins draped across the ceiling of all the classrooms. So if the laundry wasn't dry Saturday night, we'd just have to take it down in the morning. One time, I forgot. <laughs> At the last minute, as the kids are coming downstairs for Sunday school, I scrambled to take the laundry down and with our arms overflowing, quickly throwing the laundry on our bed and shutting the door, we were ready. My husband had a quick meeting with the deacons in his office, and as the four of them were meeting, he pulled out from his back pocket what he thought was a hanky. Unfortunately, it wasn't a hanky. It was my lacy panties. <laughs> my poor husband was mortified while the other men coughed and tried to stifle their laughter. <laughs> For a young pastor's wife, that would probably be pretty traumatic. When you're older, you probably go, oh, well, whatever. But in the beginning, I can imagine it would be. Yeah. Okay, what I'm going to ask you to do now is just to, I don't want to leave on how hard it was, you know, to start at times. Let's talk about with that same little group there. Um, what is something that you love about your role? and being married to a professional church worker. What's something that just, when you think about it, you are so grateful to God for that. How is it different or better than you thought it would be? Okay, just a couple more minutes for that. There we go. So I think it's important to remember, even though it is challenging at times, there are things that maybe you didn't expect. There are also some things that are maybe better than we thought it was going to be. You know, God knows what's coming. He knows each of you individually. He knows your personalities. Um, he, he knows the future. And we know that his ways aren't our ways. One of the things that I'd like to do uh, for the remainder of the time is to just give you a couple ideas on some things that I've gleaned and I've, I've observed and I've watched in dealing with people who are in ministry. And I thought maybe I'd just go ahead and pass this out right now, even though I never do that because it causes people to get distracted and look at it. So I'm going to trust you. The reason I'm passing it out is to give you something to write on in case you don't have something to write on, okay? So it's a resource list that you can take with you, but I'm sure no one's going to read it right now while I'm talking, right? Okay. So it just gives you something to write on. I wanted to encourage you to talk to your husbands about how does he feel you two are working as a team? Because you are a team. Even if you're not very active in the church, even if you don't have large roles of ministry in the, the school or the, the church Bible studies or things that are going on, you are still a team. You are his most important asset. You're more important than his education, his spiritual gifts, any area of his life. You matter more than any of those things because you can make or break him. You can build him up or you can tear him down. 
And when you're not in a good place, he can spend a lot of energy trying to make you get into a good place. So I just want you to see the value that there is in being a, a pastor's wife. Um, you need him, and he needs you, and in God's plan, t tells us in Ephesians that men and women need each other. So maybe ask him, how are we doing as a team? What do you need more of from me? What do you need less of from me? And then you can tell him, in order for us to be a better team, what is it that we need to be working on? But I'm wise enough to know that the people who are in this room are not the same women who entered into being a pastor's wife maybe 20, 30, 40 years ago. I mean, I know pastor's wives then, for one thing, you had to play the piano, right, or the organ. I mean, it, it, it was a prerequisite, I think, for going into ministry. You had to play something like that. Um, you had to be in charge of vacation Bible school, um, probably teach a ladies' Bible study. Um, you had to make casseroles to take to the shut-ins and probably homemade bread. Um, you know, you had to do all of this stuff. And Well, today, women are in a very different place. Sometimes you may do some of those things, but sometimes you may choose and your husband may choose for you not to be even that involved in the church at all. That doesn't take away from you still being a team. So I just wanted to acknowledge that women today oftentimes have their own dreams. Sure. I remember I was I'm extremely boundaries and hands off the congregation. Uh huh. He does his thing and I do mine. Okay. And I can remember one of the churches that he was interviewing for asked, you know, how does your wife plan on being involved in the ministry? Uh huh. And he said she's going to take very good care of our three children. She's going to take care of the house. She's uh -huh. doing this. You know, she's going to be my wife so that mm -hmm. I can do better in my ministry here yeah. to you. Yeah. Like, she's not going to be ministering yeah. to you. She's going to be ministering to me. Yeah. So it was, they were like, well, he didn't end up getting the call. So, mm. you know, maybe, who knows? Mm -hmm. but, uh, he, we've been very clear about that. Yeah. The teamwork doesn't have to be in the ministry. It doesn't have to be in the ministry. Yeah, this is being taped, so I'm just going to say that. Um, this, this young woman was saying that her husband made it very clear before he was going to take the call um, that his wife's ministry was to the kids and to him. And I think that's perfectly fine. When you and your husband agree on that and to let the church know in advance, they're not, they're not getting a two-for-one, which a lot of time churches think that's what they're doing. They're getting two people, but they're only going to pay one and maybe not even pay that one very well. <laughs> You know, but they, they think that. So, and you have to also figure out what was the pastor's life, wife that was like before you were there? Because sometimes the pastor's wife that was before, she did all of these things. And then you could go in and you can feel less than because you're not keeping up with what the congregation expects. So I love that your husband made that really clear at the very beginning. My wife has her own dream. She has her own career. And maybe it's taking care of the kids and taking care of me. That's, that's really great. But I think it's important that you clarify that. Many women wear more than one hat. You know, sometimes you're, you're working, sometimes you're at home, sometimes you're doing ministry. Uh, you can be in a lot of different places, but it's important that you find what fits for you and what fits for your husband. I remember a pastor's wife that I spoke to a while back who said how she felt like even though she worked at the church, she was kind of living in her husband's shadow. She said that people would give him all the attention, and even though she worked there, um, she felt like they ignored her. And when it was time for them to leave, they gave him a going-away party, and they didn't even acknowledge that she had worked there. You know, and I, I've heard other women say that. You can, they can feel like they're just not even a team. It's, it's them kind of walking behind them. Um, and I have heard women say that they have given up their careers and their identities to follow their husband. They're involved. They've got a great career going, but their husband gets a call somewhere else, and then they just give that up, and they just go there. And maybe they're getting involved, and a few years later, they give that up and go, go somewhere else. Um, if that's you, I feel like it's another issue that you might want to discuss with your husband, something that's really important, that he also support your hopes and your dreams so that you don't get that resentment kind of growing in there like you know I've given up everything for you and I still have things that I want to do because I think as a team you work together to support each other 
you want to figure out your own identity, who you are. A lot of, a lot of wives of, of pastors struggle with that. Who, who am I? I know I'm your support, but who am I apart from you? And I think talking about these things with each other can be a real help. The title of this talked about living in a fishbowl, how people are watching you. They watch how your family lives. And I was kind of thinking, I wonder how living in a fishbowl is similar to having a paparazzi follow you around. Do you think there's some similarities to that? Yeah, like what? Well, my husband and I started dating, and, and he started in the ministry. Mm -hmm. I came um, a year and a half later. Uh huh. Um, but the neighbor lady, also a member of the congregation, um, saw us planting flowers, and Mark was down doing all the dirty work uh -huh. in the dirt, um, and the buffalo gnats in Oklahoma are really annoying. Mm. Um, so, but they don't, they're not around if the wind is blowing uh -huh. because they're so tiny. Okay. Um, so I have the box of flowers, all of the flowers I had put where mm -hmm. I wanted them. So the box, I was waving over him. Uh huh. And she told everyone the next morning, Sunday morning, oh, it was so cute. Mona was fanning him because it was so hot. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and no, that isn't what I was doing at all. Yeah. So Dropping was... grapes in his mouth at the same <laughs> time. <laughs> yeah. She saw that. Yeah. Yeah. What else? You wonder. Yeah. I mean, I just, I always see the pictures, you know, as you're going through the grocery store that they, the paparazzi caught someone at just, at just a moment, you know, when they look their worst. And you know there's people who are watching you, trying to see what can they see, what can they, they catch. So when you're in ministry, you know that you lose some of your sense of privacy. You know that there's a congregation who are watching you, how you raise your kids. Um, they may even be watching how you dress. You know, are you spending too much on clothes? Or do you look like you're, you know, dressing from the thrift store? Uh, what's, what styles are you wearing? They might watch and see, you know, are you, how much makeup are you wearing? Or how much jewelry are you wearing? What kind of cars do you drive? Uh, are you taking expensive vacations? Um, I remember a pastor's wife saying to me once, she said, you know, we're going on a cruise, but you know, we got a really good deal on it. You know, it was really good. It was on sale. And it was like, I don't care. <laughs> good for you. Go on a cruise. You deserve a cruise. But have you, any of you ever felt like that, that you feel like there's people kind of watching, making sure, do you make too much money so that you can go spend it on these, these frivolous things? They might even wonder about the size of your house. You know, is your house so big and luxurious that, you know, maybe, or is it, is it are, you, are you not keeping up this small house? You know, they want to know where your kids go to school. You know, and, and especially if those kids are behaving or not. Are you, you know, really taking care of those kids? Um, people are watching in church. They're watching you sometimes when your husband's up front and he's telling about a, a, a story or a joke. Are you laughing too? You know, are you paying attention? I know all of you can identify with this. How about when you're in a grocery store and somebody from the church, the community, just comes up and wants to talk to you about, you know, something with the church? I mean, you know, you, you just sometimes don't have any privacy. People are intruding. People will come up to you and say, oh, your family's out to dinner. Now, I don't want to intrude, but, <laughs> you know, and then, and then they do. So has the public or has the church intruded on your private life at some time? Yeah, yeah, I see shaking heads. Yeah, probably so. Well, you know, you have a choice when people do that. You can think of them as stalkers. <laughs> you can think of them as people who are following you and they're out to try to catch you to do something wrong. Or you can think of them as people who are just interested in how you live the Christian life. You know, you can kind of look at the glass in a different way. They're watching you, not so much trying to catch you make a mistake or to you know, do something wrong, 
but they're looking for some good examples. The world is just void of good examples these days of people who are faithful to their spouses and are raising their children. And I think a lot of times they're, they're watching people in ministry just to see what you're doing so they can learn and glean from you. You know, you can have a chip on your shoulder and say, oh, here comes Agnes again. She's, you know, and if your kids are around, they're going to pick that up. So I just encourage you to try to use humor. Oh, here comes Gladys. You know, you can kind of laugh about it, and it, it eases a lot of the tension. And just accept that you are an object of interest. That's a whole different way of looking at it. You're an object of interest, and there are times when you're out in public, people are going to come up to you, but you also need your privacy. Eva Schaefer, co-founder of Labrie, gives a definition of the family in her book called What is the Family? She said, a family is a door that has hinges and a lock. The hinges should be well-oiled and swing open at certain times, but the lock should be firm enough to let people know that the family needs to be alone part of the time just to be a family. If a family is to be really shared, then there has to be something to share. So think about that. You and your family are an object of interest. And sometimes the door will come open. People can look in. They can see how you're doing things. But you also have the right to privacy. You have the right to shut that door and to set boundaries to protect your family. Do any of you have any ideas how, or, or some suggestions you have on how maybe you have set some boundaries with people so that they're not doing the, what's a, you know, do you remember the movie, What About Bob? But he was just trying to intrude and get into the therapist's life. You can have parishioners in your church that are like that too. Do you have any clear boundaries that you can think of? I always, I always just use the kids as excuses all the time. And so when he would get caught talking after service, uh -huh. I would say, you know, excuse me, I'm really sorry to interrupt you, but the kids, we have a basketball game. We really got to go. Yeah. Or at dinner time when they come, mm -hmm. you can see the kids just rolling their eyes. Uh -huh. like, Here we go. Yeah. I really do just interrupt and say, I'm, excuse me, I'm really sorry to yeah. apologize, but yeah. we're in a rush. We need mm -hmm. to get going because we're going somewhere. Yeah. So we need to finish our, our dinner together. Yeah. And I, I always. The kids are great excuses. Yeah. yeah, and I like the way you're saying that because you're talking about you're setting a firm boundary with someone. We're done here, but you're doing it in a nice way. You know, you're not just saying, hey, we're out of here. I don't want to talk to you. You know, you're, you're, you're using something like, oh, I wish I could stay, but the kids need to get here and get out of here. I think that's perfectly fine. Yeah, great idea. Anybody else have any ideas how you sometimes maybe establish a boundary or set something? You guys feel free to, to jump in peanut gallery back there. I show up at your house, too. Uh -huh. I always use the kids as excuse, too. Yeah. I'm really sorry. I can't let you in. Yeah. So's napping. Yeah. The kids got into the flower and it's all over. <laughs> I don't lie. Yeah. So, yeah. But I mean, <laughs> yeah. What are you going to do when you don't have kids anymore? Yeah. <laughs> the grandkids. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> or the grandkids, you know. Something else, yeah. You can tell them that your daughter or your son has just called. Yeah. I used to use the reverse with my kids. I would tell my kids, if there's ever a time that you think you shouldn't be doing something, you know, you can say, oh, my mom said I couldn't do that. You know, and then, so I think it works reverse, too. That's great. Judy, I have a good example. Good. tells the story that someplace she lived, the neighbor talked too much. And so she would, uh, she'd go out to, you know, put the lawn uh -huh. down on the line. She'd yeah. also put on the tea kettle. Uh -huh. And that way, <laughs> the, lady, the lady, the lady, yeah. the yeah. the tea kettle would go off. So yeah. Said, oh, the kettle. <laughs> oh, that's a great idea. <laughs> Make sure you've got a, you'd, not a hot pot, but a tea kettle, huh? We didn't do this intentionally, but we used to live really close to our church, like within a mile of our church. Uh huh. And we would get that occasional drop in first. Mm -hmm. We just kind of tried to entertain them a little and get them out eventually. Mm -hmm. But when we went to buy a house, we moved to Chandler, which is further than Tempe, you know, so we were further. Uh huh. Away. No one's ever dropped in since. We're uh, yeah. 13 miles away, I guess. Uh huh. So it wasn't intentional, but they just brought yeah. we don't have that drop in. First. So that's a good boundary. If they're dropping in too much, move farther away from the church, huh? Okay. Okay. 
Well, there's going to be times when being in the public eye is a burden. Times when you have a lot of stress in your life, maybe you have health issues going on, maybe you're having a marital challenge, maybe one of your kids, you know, is a struggle, and maybe you're not wanting your life to be so private. Uh, one of the books that I'm recommending is this book by Kay Warren called Sacred Privilege. Um, her husband, Rick Warren, wrote The uh, Purpose Driven Life. It's on the other side of the paper that you're not looking at right now. Okay, you don't have to write it down. <laughs> it's right there in the resource. Um, but Kay and Rick went through a really, really hard time. They had a couple of kids, and um, one of their sons, Matthew, struggled with mental illness during his life, and then he committed suicide. And you can imagine someone who is as visible as Kay and Rick Warren out there, I mean, he's on TV shows, he's, you know, everywhere, not wanting to just come right back to the public eye again. And I know after I heard it happened, I just kind of wondered, what's going on with them? Are they ever going to surface? So in this book, she says, when Matthew died, being in the public eye was excruciating for me. I knew I would eventually settle into my commitment to leverage my visibility for God's kingdom, but it wouldn't be anytime soon. I couldn't bear to know I was being watched and evaluated. I didn't go to church at all for four months. I barely left the house except to see my family or go to the cemetery. And when I went back to church, I switched to the service that my kids and grandkids attended so I could be one of a group, not a lone person in the front row where I normally sat. I would wait until the service began and then slip into the back row as unobtrusively as possible, making sure I had safe people, family, friends, small group members on every side. And if I couldn't handle being in a sensory stimulating environment on a particular day, I would just leave. I usually left before the last amen anyway so that I didn't have to engage in casual conversation with strangers or even familiar people. It was just too much. And then she talks about how it was about a year and a half before she was really ready to sit in the front row again. She says, as pastors, families were not just objects of interest, were also living object lessons to a watching congregation, neighborhood, and extended family about who God is. We make him known by our lives, public and private. And so it's okay. You know, when you're going through something that is really heavy, maybe you get a diagnosis that you're, you know, your dad has cancer, or maybe there's something in your own life going on, it, it's okay to have more privacy then than maybe you would normally have. And so I just wanted to make sure that you, you know, feel okay about that. There's times that you're an op the door swings open, and then there's times that you shut it, and it's perfectly fine to protect yourself during those times. I think one of the hardest things that the pastor's wives that I've talked to that deal with um, is criticism. You know, hearing other people's opinions about what they think you're not doing right or your, your kids aren't doing right or your husband's not doing right. Sometimes it comes from the church. Sometimes it comes from outside the church. Sometimes it comes from your own family. Your own extended family might be putting their own two cents in there on what they think you should be doing differently. You know, and it can come in different forms. It can come in just a, you know, rolling eyes and a look and a huff or a little whispering gossip. Or it can come in downright, you know, negative terms, you know, where people just come right to your face and tell you. It can be a full-on attack. It can be escalated to the point where you know, many of you, there's splits in the church. Or it might even be to the point that maybe your husband's been asked to leave. When criticism becomes so strong, it has incredible power to wound and to injure, much like a divorce, a splitting, a separation. And the church is made up of imperfect people. We know that. We shouldn't be surprised when these imperfect people act that way. But I think a lot of times we just expect. We're Christians after all. I mean, we should be kind and we should be, you know, lifting each other up. And we should be. But we don't because we are still all sinners. And the conflicts that we have in churches... You know, it would be nice if they were only about big things, but sometimes they can be about the smallest things. 
You know, I know churches that have, that have split over the color of carpet, you know, or um, the sign that's going to go out front, that new sign that, that takes the denominational name, you know, off of it. Um, they can be really silly things. And I always think it's kind of like that in a marriage. Most of the fights that I've had with my husband are on really stupid things. They're not really big things. But unfortunately, you know, that's, that's the way a church runs. And some of the things that bug people aren't even always the big things. My, uh, my son is the pastor, and so I was talking to his, his wife. And one of the things she said was that people will come and talk to her about things that they really don't want to talk to her husband about. You, have you had that happen? They kind of slide back. She was saying somebody was complaining to her about the landscaping at the church. You know, like that's her responsibility. Like, why don't we have somebody doing, you know, thinking that she's going to go back and tell, tell Toby about it. You know, so I would say, um, you know, there are, there are sometimes people who can really rub you the wrong way. People who, when you see them coming, you want to go the other direction. And there are people who are going to even leave the church. And we can take that really personally, that maybe you did something wrong, or you should have said this, or you should have done that. Um, and I've heard one of the best things to do when people are leaving to just to say, we're really glad that you were here. We hope at your next place that you know that you'll find a place of fellowship and wish them well and sometimes celebrate that they left, you know. <laughs> but um, most of the time, I think people don't give you the opportunity to say that to them. Most of the times they slide out and you never hear from them again. But it's important not to blame yourself and take personally people leaving the church. And I think that can be hard. If someone criticizes you, I encourage you to ask yourself, is there any truth in it at all? I mean, if someone says, I can't believe you're wearing so much makeup, you know, or somebody saying, you know, I can't believe you let your kids go to, you know, what, whatever, ask yourself, is there any truth in it? This is the humble part of leadership, that we, we want to be open to feedback that people have to us. And if there's any truth to it, then you just receive it and apply it and you make whatever changes might have to apologize. And if it's not true, eat it like you'd eat a fish. You know, throw away the bones and eat the meat and just go, you know what? I'm not, that is not true. I am not claiming and naming that. I'm going to let it go. Don't get bogged down on the small stuff because there will always be people who are going to criticize. There's always going to be people who think that you ought to be doing something differently because we're all different. And then there are people who talk a lot more than they should talk. I want you to remember, women, that you have a God to serve. You have a husband. Probably most of you have children. And eventually you'll have grandchildren. Some of you have careers. And you have a God to serve. And don't let these people steal your joy. Don't let them take away what you have been doing for God. Um, one of the things that Kate Warren says in her book is that there are only three ways I know how to survive and recover from criticism, complaints, conflicts, and the resulting wounds. First of all, you have to leave it to God. Second, be grateful for the positive side of ministry. And I think you know in your church probably 80, 90% of the people are good people. They're the ones who gave you the positive things to talk about earlier. So it's focusing on them. And then she says, and practice radical forgiveness. <laughs> you know, sometimes it's the people in your church that you really get to practice forgiving. And I would say if it lingers and you find yourself down the road thinking of that person, then maybe it's the Holy Spirit's way of just reminding you, you have a little bit more forgiveness to do. One of the things that I do with my clients is just say, write a letter to that person that you're not going to mail and tell them how you're feeling. Or you can lament to God and write to him how you feel about allowing this to happen. There's just something about processing that that helps us be able to let go of it a lot faster. Otherwise, we can tend to kind of ruminate over and over again. You might be able to identify with um, Hebrews 12, 15, in the Phillips paraphrase, it says, Be careful that none of you fails to respond to the grace which God gives. For if he does, there can very easily spring up in him a bitter spirit, which is not only bad in itself, but can also poison the lives of many others. So we want to make sure that we keep short accounts. We can't control what other people are going to say, what other people are going to do. But we can learn to not take it so personally and control our responses to them. 
people are going to let us down. You know, it's, it's a fact of life. And especially if they say something about our kids, then, you know, we're going to come out swinging. <laughs> but we have the option of, um, you know, holding a grudge, um, keeping a record of wrongs, kind of reminding ourselves over and over again what they've done, uh, just refusing. I'm not going to let it go. I remember one lady that came in for counseling one time, and in her purse, I was talking to her about her marriage, and she said, my husband, just a minute, and she started bringing out all these pieces of paper, and they were things he had done wrong. And I said, why are you keeping these in your purse? And she says, because every time we have a fight and he accuses me of something, I can't think of anything to say. So I'm writing them down so then I can remember. You know, so I think I turned into Dr. Phil, like, so how's this working for you? <laughs> you know, not working very well. And it doesn't work well for us either if we try to, you know, keep a record of how people have hurt us. Another alternative is to wait for them to apologize first. That doesn't usually happen. Sometimes it does. And we can even feel really justified, you know, in what we've done and that they they need to apologize to me before I can move on. Or the last choice is just choose to move on. I am not going to give this any more energy. I'm not going to think about it. I'm not going to ruminate. I'm not going to lose any more hours of sleep. You know, I'm just going to let it go. I mean, you, you gals are busy women. There's a lot of people who really need you. And if you have families, your families really need you. And so it's important that you take care of yourself. And part of that is letting go of these resentments or the ways that people have hurt you and forgive them so that you can move on. Not an easy thing. And I don't mean to like, oh, it's so easy, forgive them, move on. But I'm saying it's important enough that if you find there are people that you have resentments against, I encourage you to, to maybe even talk to a counselor about it if you're finding you're having trouble letting it go. And um, if you are able to let it go, you'll find that you can live life a lot lighter. The other thing, because you're busy women, is I really want to encourage you to eat, sleep, and move. You know, eat healthy like you try to feed your kids. Because if you're on the run all the time and you're trying to live off of coffee and toast and, you know, whatever's left over on the plate when they leave, you know, you're not going to have the fuel that you need to fuel your own bodies um, and, and get enough sleep. Because sometimes we can just stay up too late and get up too early. And if we don't get enough rest, it's hard to be our best. And then move. That means just walking you know, or running or exercising or doing something so that you get the juices flowing. Um, I feel like you gals, like, a lot, like your husbands, are professional givers. And so it's not always easy for professional givers to take care of themselves. So I encourage you to think about, are there ways that I need to take better care of myself? And maybe even talk to your husband about that. Is there something that you see that maybe I could do that I would be taking better care of myself? Um, secondly, the thing I wanted to say is that um, you need the Spirit's help more than ever. You know, you are women who are out there on the front battle lines. And sometimes when I've talked to pastors' wives, they've been resentful that they, there's no spiritual leadership in their own home, that their husbands are out saving the world, so to speak, or encouraging the world, and in their own home there's nothing spiritual that's really going on. Well, I just want to give you permission to talk to your husband about it and ask him if he's not okay with, um, with taking over, would it be okay if you did something? Because most pastors that I've talked to are relieved when their wife says, hey, would it be okay if we did this devotional together or if we did this with the kids? Would you be all right with that? And it lets them off the hook, and then it helps you feel like, yeah, we're having this spiritual environment that I want to have in our home. And then I encourage you to carve out time for your own soul um, because life is so busy. But we, if we don't do that, we just get exhausted spiritually. And then we're trying to give to others when we don't have anything left for ourselves. There's a lot of ways you can do that today. I mean, there's a lot of apps that you can find on your phone. Um, I've got one I love called uh, Lectio 365 that has a morning and an evening devotion, one that I go to sleep with and kind of in the mornings, you know, you can put it on. But there's, there's tons of them that are out there. And, of course, you know, just finding some sort of a... Um, of a Bible study that, that you can do. Um, the other thing that I'd encourage you to do is to make time for a retreat. 
you know, just to get away to women's retreats are great to be able to have places to go and laugh and have fun. And also maybe a personal retreat. Maybe you would talk with your husband and say that you're going to go just offer a day of solitude and be able to just listen to God and let him speak to you as you get into the word. Um, the third thing um, that I want to encourage you to do is to be sure that you have a, a soul friend, a soul girlfriend, someone that you connect on a really deep level with, someone that you can trust and you can talk to about the challenges that you have. And, you know, that can be really hard in the ministry. I hear that all the time. You have trouble trusting sometimes the women that are in your own church because you don't know if what you share is going to go somewhere else. And so then I'd say find someone outside the church. There are plenty of other Christian women that are outside your church that you can find to connect with. Um, we did a, a drama at um, Shepherd's Canyon here. We do drama therapy here um, a few uh, weeks ago. And um, one of the things that we did was someone who had been abandoned by a lot of their, their friends. And the one by one, people left the chair. And the circle was empty. It was just her and her husband sitting there. And it was, it was really impacting just to see how much loss had experienced in her life. And I think some of you can identify with that. You know, some of you can say that you, you understand what it's like to lose friends when you move to a new place. Or people who've betrayed you. You know, that's another story that I hear a lot. People who you thought were your really good friends, you're meeting with them, you're playing games with them, you know, you're, you're spending time with them. And then the next thing you hear, you know, there's kind of a rumble around the church, like maybe people are not as happy with you or your, I mean, you and your husband, and maybe there's talk about you leaving, and then you find out your good friends are a part of that. I've heard that many times. And when that happens, then it, it's like, who can I trust? I feel like my best friends have betrayed me. And I would just encourage you to say, try, pray. God, give me a really good friend. Give me someone that I can share my, my heart with, either inside or outside your own church, because your husband can't meet all your needs. You know, he can try, and you can try to get him, but it won't work because we're not wired that way. We as women need other women in our lives. And I'd say if you're, you know, you, you're afraid, take baby steps. Just put a little bit out there with a woman and see what happens. If you share a little bit of your life with her, is it mutual or is she just letting you be her counselor? You know, is she sharing her life so that you go back and forth with little baby steps? Is she keeping it confident? You don't throw it all out there when you've had trouble trusting. Put a little bit out there at a time. But, you know, Jesus had all the people and then he had his 12 and then he had his three, and then John talks about himself as the one that Jesus loved. And so it's a good example for us that we need a small circle of people that we can trust because life is hard at times. So I've already given you the resource list. I have a couple other things I want to hand out just as I'm finishing up. Do my commercials. First commercial is for Shepherd's Canyon. This looks like this. On the other side is Standing Stones. That's the place where um, Shepherd's Canyon Retreats holds their retreats. It's a beautiful conference center. So if your church or someone you know is looking for a place to, to rent for a, um, a time, a retreat, I would suggest that. It's beautiful out in Wickenburg, out in the desert, with a pool and a hot tub. And we have cornhole and ping pong. And it's a great place to be. And this talks about Shepherd's Canyon. So if you would take um, one or two of those, if you've got someone to pass it on to, that's the information when people are challenged or in crisis for them to be able to go and spend a week there. Henry Cloud says, Henry Cloud, who wrote the, the book Boundaries, says that we are hurt through relationships, but we're also healed through relationships. There's no other way. You can't be hurt and then just pull back and wait for you to feel better. You have to begin to lean in. And that's what I see at Shepherd's Canyon is that people come, they tell their stories, and they're able to find trust there, and they begin to heal. So another commercial that I have here is for Refresh. It's a weekend, not a weekend, it's a three-night retreat 
of enrichment for pastors and their wives. So that might be of interest to you. And my colleague Phil back here and I will be leading that. It's going to, we have the first one coming up in April. Um, so that tells you a little bit about it. And if you've got someone you want to share it with, go ahead and take a couple and maybe share it with your church. Um, sometimes your church will help you come to something like that to help get you refreshed and replenished before you need to go to a Shepherd's Canyon retreat. Then the third thing that I have here to share um, is a retreat that I'm going to be doing just for Pastor's Wife. Both of the ones that we're doing out there are very intimate. The, um, the one for couples, there's only six couples at a time that come. So Phil and I will be working very closely. And the one for Pastor's Wives is, I think it's a limit of eight women um, that will be there for three nights. So that, it's called The River. And it's a river in the desert where we'll be um, joining together and sharing. I've been doing this for a couple of years with women who find it really uh, refreshing to be with other pastors' wives where we play and we encourage each other and share the challenges of being a pastor's wife. Um, a couple other things that I put on your resource sheet are some missionary um, uh, referrals. I work with two different organizations, one called Thrive Ministry and one called Asmara Haven Retreats. Um, I'm giving that to you so you could share it with any missionaries that you know or are involved with your church. Um, we put on retreats that are virtually free for them. Well, it's not virtual. They are pretty much free for them. Um, and then we also do a virtual retreat too. Um, but they're all over the world and they get to come for um, for four days and be replenished themselves. And that's really powerful. And then they have a virtual retreat coming up with Thrive at the end of March for people are in 11 countries that I heard have already signed up to come. Do, um, do most of you know the term an influencer on social media? Have you heard that before? Yeah. What is that? Can you tell us? Yeah. Or not. Uh huh. It's someone who takes a lot of pictures. And <laughs> Selfies. Some, you know, sometimes people pay them to market their products. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, it's like a, a normal person uh -huh. is treated like a celebrity. You're right. That is a great way to describe it. They are people who, they don't become an influencer until they get a pretty huge following of people that are watching them on YouTube or wherever they are. Well, gals, I just wanted you to know you don't have to have a huge, a huge following. You are influencers. You are women who are impacting people in your neighborhood, in your church, in your family. You are influencers. And I'm going to end with this. This is a quote that Rick Warren was talking about, a pastor's wife. He said, the impact and influence of the wife of a pastor may be the most underestimated influence for good in our culture today. Few realize how many benefits and blessings these women bring to their communities. Few realize how much they've shaped the past, shaped churches today, and are shaping the future at the grassroots level. They are, I love this, stealth change agents. <laughs> Leading in the days of change, confusion and chaos. Encouraging the discouraged, comforting the grieving and brokenhearted, challenging people to become what God intended them to be, and defending the defenseless, lifting up the fallen, showing grace to broken, teaching, reaching out, caring, and sharing the burdens of others in the seasons of life. Don't underestimate the influence that you have. You are an influencer, and you are a stealth change agent. Okay? I'm going to pray for you. Lord, we talk a lot about how husbands are called. And yet I believe you've called these women. You know their gifts and their talents. You know their struggles. You know them inside out. You are the God who sees us. And I'm asking you right now that in your strength and your wisdom, that you would equip each one of these women to accomplish what lies before them. I know this COVID season has been hard 
hard on churches, hard on families, hard on pastors and their wives. And so as it looks like we're kind of getting out, I just pray that you would infuse them with your hope for the future and your, your blessing on them and their family in the days ahead. And we will thank you for that. Lord Jesus, amen. Thank you for coming. I would just add for the, the couple's retreat and also the ladies' retreat, uh -huh. uh, in addition to checking with your churches or your LWMLs, if there's funds that would help pay for that, mm -hmm. also contact your district offices. Many of the districts already have scholarships set aside, not just for the pastors, but also for the families uh, that might be able to help pay for that. So. Thank you. Thank you. That just happens to be Rich, who's the president of our Standing Stones Shepherds Canyon board. <laughs> so he knows what he's talking about. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> you can fool some of the people some of the time. <laughs> yeah. So leave here as a stealth change agent, huh? <laughs> You're welcome. Thanks for coming. Buy this book if you haven't read it. It's really a good one. Thanks for coming, Vicki. Yeah, good to see you. Bye bye, Sandy. Yeah. Peanut Gallery. You were, you were encouraging me. Thank you. Terry didn't snore that loud. <laughs> Not like me, huh? <sighs> Katie, you know how it feels when you're done. <laughs> yeah. Do you have another one? Nope. Yeah, I was